And is your mom still alive now? Uh, she passed away from a drug overdose while I was incarcerated. Oh my God, I'm so sorry to hear that. Yeah. While I was in prison, I about like 18, 19 years old. And uh, you know, them old heads, they've been down there 30, 40 years. So, you know, they always listen to us youngsters. And at this time in my life, I had developed so much hatred and animosity towards my mother. Mm. And and I was ashamed and embarrassed. Like, you know, my mom was a dope fiend. She tricking the things, you know what I'm saying? And as a little kid, you get made fun of these things around the neighborhood, you know what I'm saying? So I had completely disowned her. But while I was in prison, old school, you know, they asking you questions, where you from, woo the woo. So they asked me about my mama. I was like, man, I don't fuck with that bitch. Man, the man grabbed me and slammed me against the wall so fast. But, man, the man had me up against the wall, and he was just like, you don't know what your mama done been through and what she done had to accept from another man just to make sure you and your brothers had this and that. Welcome to The Dash. You know The Dash is that tiny line between your life start date and end date. It's your story. The chapters in your book, your journey. Your journey. Your journey. Get ready for real conversations with real people telling real stories about the realities of failure, setbacks, and success. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. We're rolling. Let's go. Dance in three, two, one. Hey, what's up, everybody? Thank you guys so much for coming back to another amazing episode of the Dash Podcast. Now, I'm going to challenge y'all every week. I got to ask you, how are you using your dash? You know, your dash is that little small line between your birth date and your death date, right? So you got to use your dash to the best of your ability to help others, to grow others, and to grow yourself. So today's guest, y'all, I've been waiting on this man's energy for a minute. I mean, from the moment I met him, there are just some people that have God's light inside of them. And they use their dash for other people and in a way that is indescribable. So, uh, let, let, can, can you mind if I run down all your titles, sir? Man, that uh, just sound good then. Um, <laughs> entrepreneur, inspirational speaker, best-selling author, the face of prison reform and reform, reform gear. You're going to see him on Instagram. I always talk about it's the big reform. Yes. Throw it up. My man, Keidre and Brewster. Thank you so much for being with big us. Big reform. <laughs> that big though no nah, man uh it's pretty big the influence <laughs> <laughs> y'all i met kedrian at an event um and there are just some people that you are like the world needs to know who you are right and which is why i invited you to the dash because your story dash. is absolutely outstanding so um, we know that you have your own trucking company, right? A, a very successful trucking company. But I always say a lot of people don't respect the hustle until mm. they know where you came from. I got you. So let's go back. Who is Keydrian? Um, I'm from Dallas. <clears throat> I grew up in, a, <clears throat> excuse me. You fine? I grew up in Oak Cliff. Um, I've been running the streets since the adolescence. My mother, she grew up in the streets, so you know she had me around it, and you know I grew up hustling, hitting legs, game banging. Doing what us youngsters do that come up in the urban communities, you know. And uh, that landed me in prison. Spent about 13 years down there. And uh, I tell people, for me, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. Mm. A lot of people take that like I'm advocating to go to prison. And it's not that I'm advocating it as much as I'm just telling you that if I had I not went to prison, I'd be dead or either I'd be locked away for a life. Mm. So that was uh, one of the biggest transformations that took place in my life. Everything that I experienced in there going from a boy to a man, and then once I was released, it was like taking candy from a baby. Mm. Okay, we're going to get to that part. We're going to get to that part. I got. I, I want to back up. I want to back up. You can't just You can't just fast forward through the story you, like that, Gideon. Okay, so you said from an adolescence you were in the streets gang banging. How old do you think that you were exposed? Well, you were exposed from, I guess, forever, but when you right. got involved in the streets. Man, I was about 11 years old. 11. First time I ever hit a lick, my mama the one who turned me on to it. She called me and was like, hey, what you doing? I said, I'm chilling. She was like, man, uh, what you and your little friends doing? I said, no, nah. she said, I need you to come up to this hotel room. So, you know, I go up there to the hotel. I'm like, what's up? She like, man, I got this dude in here. He's scary, baby. She was like, uh, you and your homeboys, y'all think y'all gangsters anyway. I need you to come in here. I'm going to leave the door on luck. I'm like, yeah, but what, what I'm going to use? She was like, that little gun you got, that little 22. All you got to do is pull it on him, baby. He's scary. Man, we went and hit the lid. Keydrian. Hold on. 11 years old. At 11 years old. Uh, my mama used to use me to steal. 
I'm the I'm the decoy when we go into the stores. I'm the decoy. She gonna go in there and do her thing. So you know, um, man, I come up around it. Now that I'm older and I'm grown, I understand what my mother was dealing with. Whereas as an adolescent, you know, I'm just doing what my mama say do. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Whatever she's saying do is what I'm doing. But I've been exposed to the to the streets since about eleven. Since I was just active, doing something. You know, may that been stealing, robbing, uh, throwing rocks at cars and running. Knocking them doors and running and, you know, so, yeah, it's about 11. Man, when you think about age of 11, what you think, because you, you, you have a baby. I got a baby girl, Vicky Teresa. You Vicky Teresa, I love yeah. it. How old is she? She's 18 months. And you think about Vicky Teresa and you think to yourself, at the age of 11, you just want her to be worried about dolls and video games right. and, you know, and at the age of 11, you were doing some grown man stuff. Right, yeah, I was already here at the juvenile, but I tell people, you know, the streets is like a drug. Mm-hmm. One hitting is over with. You addicted. No matter what age you at. Once I did that, that one time and got to seeing how I could get away with this and get away with that, you know, it started small, but that little stealing out the stove and doing little stuff like that, that that what leads up to the big stuff. So then you start small and then how does how does it progress? Because I want you to understand, so today one thing I love about you is your transparency. Right. It's almost like when we're talking about somebody who has an addiction to, it could be a drug, it could be alcohol, it could be anything, it could be shopping. You know what I mean? Right. It always starts real little. It never just hits you over the head uh-uh. at just one time. It always seems so innocent at first. Uh, and that's why people end up going to prison for life. Um, I tell people all the time. When somebody going to go hit a lick or commit a robbery, the intentions is to never kill nobody. But once you get in there, things get out of control, things happen. That's how somebody end up getting killed and you end up getting a life sentence. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, we started to smile when I was growing up. You know, might go get a little uh, 50 slab and cut it down, start selling a little dope. And, you know, my mama was addicted to drugs. So, you know, I was selling my mama drugs when I was 13, 14 mm-hmm. years old. That's just... Um, when you come up in it like that, this is just how it is. Mm-hmm. And is your mom still alive now? Uh, she passed away from a drug overdose while I was incarcerated. Oh my God, I'm so sorry to hear that. Yeah. I mean, and e- even I want to say this before we even go any further. Your mom did not understand. I, oh no, 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 no. So let me say this though, Lady yeah. Jay. Despite how transparent I'm being, I want you to know that um, while I was in prison. I'm about like 18, 19 years old. And, uh, you know, them old heads, they've been down there 30, 40 years. So, you know, they always listening to us youngsters. And at this time in my life, I had developed so much hatred and animosity towards my mother. Mm. And and I was ashamed and embarrassed. Like, you know, my mama's a dope fiend. She tricking the things, you know what I'm saying? And as a little kid, you get made fun of these things around the neighborhood, you know what I'm saying? So I had completely disowned her. But while I was in prison... Old school, you know, they asking you questions, where you from, woo the woo. So they asked me about my mama. I was like, man, I don't fuck with that bitch. And when I said it, they were kind of like, you know what I'm saying? This was my attitude towards her. Man, it was an old school. I'll never forget this man. His name was Pookie Wookie. Man, the man grabbed me and slammed me against the wall so fast. And my response to not fighting him, it ain't have nothing to do with me being scary or nothing like that because, yeah, keep talking. you know, I've been fighting since I've been in the prison. Mm-hmm. But, man, the man had me up against the wall and he was just like, you don't know what your mama done been through and what she done had to accept from another man just to make sure you and your brothers had this and that. You know what I'm saying? The way you talking about her, you supposed to be a man? What you done did for her? What you done? And I'm just kind of, I was in so much of an awe, like, damn, you know my mama or something? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, what's Keep going on? Because he was serious, you know. I could see death in his eyes. He would like, say something else about her. Say something. And I was just kind of like, man, what homie tripping on? You know what I'm saying? And it was that moment where the trajectory of the outlook and opinion and ideals that I had of my mother was completely different because I understood that a lot of what she was enduring and what she went through was to take care of me and my brothers, you know. Mm. She been in abusive relationships where men mistreated her and, you know what I'm saying, I understood now as an adult but as a child coming up with that type of trauma, you're not able to even identify what's really taking place. So I'm being transparent with you telling you of the past, but... 
as we stand today, before she passed away, we was actually in a uh, in a very good space. She was really blown away by the man that I had became in prison because my mm-hmm. first few years, I didn't even communicate with her. Mm-hmm. So by the time she started back communicating with me, she was so blown away by who I had became. So despite the upbringing that I had with her, you know what I'm saying, without my mom, I wouldn't be who I am today because that's where I get my hustle from, my swag, me being so savvy, smart, all those are attributes of my mother. It's just, like I say, the drugs took over. Yeah, it's it, that's really good because a lot of times how our parents do bring us up, uh-huh. we never, our parents never sit us down and talk about the trauma that they went through. That right. led them to their decisions that could have possibly led to how they raised us, maybe addictions that they, you know, they ended up be, being a part of or whatever. We don't we only hear bits and pieces of the story. We never hear the whole thing. Yeah. What what caused this? What put them in that place? And I tell people it was a man who turned my mom out on drugs. Mm. What started out as a, you know, she wanted to have fun with him and please him, you know what I'm saying? And that's what happened. But that's why I believe men are so powerful, man, because, you know, you'll miss God or queen and mm. you'll destroy her whole life. And mm. when you destroy her, you're destroying so many lives behind her from the womb, the kids, and it's just an ongoing cycle. And you said it earlier when you were talking about how you started in the streets. It was small. Same thing with a woman and that man turning her on. It was probably something real small at first. It was no big deal. It was just, oh, we just going to do this because it's, you uh, know. They started out lacing the dope. They used to smoke weed and they'll put a little of it in the weed. They called it Primo back then Yeah, in the 90s coming up. So, you know, that led to now she full blown and, you know, she in and out of jail. I seen my mother going to jail when I was 12, 13 years old. So, you know, just being around that environment, especially when you're a child, uh, that's very impressionable. That's a lot of trauma. That's a lot of heartache that the child is enduring that nobody even knows about. Because like I say, it was an embarrassment for me to come outside and, man, your mama was around there tricking that. Your mama did. I'm like, damn. You know what I'm saying? So that's why I um, attribute prison to a big part of who I am because it gave me that it gave me that time to go from the boy to the man and able to comprehend and process what it is that my mother dealing with and how I'm supposed to be in her life to, you know, uplift her and build her and get her together. That's good. So you mentioned um, you have brothers? Right. I got two of them. You got two brothers. Are you the youngest, oldest, middle I'm child? the oldest. My middle brother was killed while I was in prison, and my baby brother, he went to prison while I was in prison. So growing up, when you start, you know, with the street life, are you trying to keep them away from it? Are they just naturally getting into it? Nah, um, actually, man, I got a shirt. You seen my partner, uh, he got on a shirt that say, stop giving little homies bad game. Yeah. And that that shirt comes from me giving my little brother bad game, misguiding him. That's what got him killed. You know, too often we glorify and, you know, make it like it's cool to be doing that goofy stuff. And that goofy stuff is what get the little homies killed. My brother was writing me in prison. He hitting up the hood. And I'm going to Rex showing my partners, yeah, this is where we breeding up in the cliff. This where I'm from, man. Two, three weeks later, they called me to the chapel, and I would tell me my little brother had been killed. He was just 16 years old. My God. So I tell people, like, man, you don't you don't know your influence, and you don't know your power, because you like, man, that's my little brother. That's my little cousin. That's my nephew. But them, them kids are paying attention. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? They looking for that acceptance. They looking for all that from you. And, you know, me doing that got a little bro killed at a young age. So it's something that I... um. It's something that I hold near and dear to my heart as far as when I'm dealing with the youth because I understand they impressionable, they vulnerable. You know, influence is, is, is everything. It is, definitely. How old were you when you finally went to prison? I was 17. 17 years old. Right. Uh, do you mind me asking what the charge was? Uh-uh. I had four aggravated robbers with deadly weapons and four aggravated assaults with deadly weapons. And so at the time when you were, I guess, waiting on your sentencing, how many how many years were you facing? So they came to me with 70, but we knew I wasn't taking it. <laughs> <laughs> Deidre, shut up. <laughs> we knew I wasn't taking it. I mean, they came, 70. but... Uh... <laughs> yeah, they came with 70, but we're not taking it. But uh, they went from 70 to 60 to 50, you know. They almost got me at the 20. And because uh, I'm listening to these jailhouse lawyers. 
Because did you have a court appointed lawyer? I had a court time? appointed lawyer, but you know the guys on the inside who go to the law library and they think they know the law forwards and backwards. They like, man, young said I ain't got nothing on you. If they went from seventy years to twenty years, that means they ain't got nothing on you. No evidence. That's not what that means. <laughs> <laughs> that, is not what, that is not what that means. And um, I remember actually calling my mama and telling her, like, man, they offering me the 20. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, man, I don't want that. My mama was like, boy, you lost your mind? Sign for the 20 years. You know you're going to be able to come back home. But I'm listening to them. I'm kind of like, man, mama, I'm going to go in here one more time. You felt like them. you was in Vegas. Like, yeah, yo, you like, rolling the dice. <laughs> I went in there. They came back. They said 15. They said 15. Now I want to go home. Yeah. Oh, hold up. Let's let go back in. <laughs> you know, so maybe they were uh, right. <laughs> it took them about six months to finally give me um ten years. Okay. It took them about six months. I sat in the county about right at about a year, year and a half. They gave me right, right about a year and a half to uh and really once they got down to the ten, I was telling the lawyer, like, man, can you see if you can give me probation? This is my first time. <laughs> yeah. And he was just like, No, Mr. Brewster, we're gonna send you back to the wing. And I'm finna call your family, like, because if we go in there and tell them that you don't want the 10, they're going to go to trial. Mr. Bruce said, that's a whole different. And I know that's to be true. I can't tell you how many homeboys I got going there playing with them people. They offering you 10, 15 years. Now I'm going to trial. Now they got life. Oh, So uh, it's something that I done seen numerous of times. I can't tell you how many homeboys I got like that. They offer them 15, 20 years. For whatever reason, for whether it's right, wrong, however it go, they feel like I, I'm a, I didn't do it, I didn't do it. Going there, go to trial, uh, they sentencing you to life, fifty years, sixty years. So I was blessed with the time I got. It, uh, I think it was right, it was right at the amount. And I tell people, you know, uh, when I got caught for this case, that was the first time I got caught, not the first time I done it. Right, but it was it was your first case. It was the first time I had ever got caught, though. Mm-hmm. Right. So let me ask you this: You mentioned you sat in county for about a year. About a year. Why were? Because I want people to understand how the system works. Uh-huh. You know, not only are we here to hear your story, but also to inform and educate too, right? So you're sitting there. Why couldn't you be out on probation at the time? Oh, uh, I couldn't be out on probation because I couldn't make the bond. Huh? Um, most, uh, especially for African-American men growing up in the urban communities, you catch that big case, it's going to cost some money to get out of there. You know, I'm from the hood. My people ain't got no money like that. My people ain't finna put up their houses and all this stuff. How much was the bond? Me. I think the bond was like 100000 So I think I had to have like uh, 10000 to get out or put up the house and you know, uh, my mama told me when I left the county, hey, man, we ain't got that kind of family that's going to be doing nothing for you. When you get down there, you better find your hustle. You know, that's the kind of family that I come from. So that's what a lot of people don't take into consideration is like, who got $10,000 to come up with to get you out of jail? Who got 20000 You know what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah, oh, it's serious. I tell people this all the time, man. Uh, just know when the penal system get a hold of you, it's, it's showtime. All that rah rah gangster shit you've been talking, you finna get an opportunity to see if you really standing on that. Um, it's serious. So you're a 17 year old kid, right? Do you remember the first day going to prison? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's the last time I ever talked to my mama uh, while she was alive. That was the last conversation I ever had with her on the phone. And it's funny because I remember telling her like, "Man, mama, they done came and called my name, Brewster. You on the chain?" She was like, okay. I'm like, nah, mama, they finna send me to prison. Like, they here to come pick me up. Mm-hmm. And she listening, and I'll never forget I was heartbroken by this. You know, I, I was looking for her to say, I love you. It's going to be okay. She wasn't saying nothing like that. She was on some, yeah, so uh, when you get down there, you need to make sure they know you from Oak Cliff. They need to make sure that, uh, you, you know, you got to hustle for yourself because ain't nobody finna send you nothing. Um, this little money that I got is for you to get your appliances. So, you know, and I was just like, damn. In my mind at the time, I'm a kid, so I'm processing it like, damn, my mama, you you still on this gangster stuff. I just told you these people is going to send me to prison, you know. And as a kid, you just want somebody to tell you I love you. It's going to be okay. Encourage but, uh, you. My mama, you know, she wasn't a Claire Huxtable type of woman. Now, fast forward, I'm glad that my mother had the strength to do that to me at that time. You know what I'm saying? That wasn't the time for her to be on no week. And it, it was showtime because she knew what I was going to go 
in faith. She had just came home from prison. So, you know, she knew when you get down here, um, all that stuff you've been in the streets, right, it's going to be that showtime. So, you know, at the time I was hurt, but I, I'm, I'm thankful that she done it to me. Yeah, because she was basically preparing you for right. what the real was as opposed to selling yeah. you a dream. There, there you go. She was getting me ready for, hey, this was really going to take place when you get down there. We don't have no family where you finna be going to commissary every week. Mm -hmm. Nuh-uh. I'm finna send you this little three, four hundred dollars that I got. It's for you to get your boots, you some uh, T-shirts, your boxes, all the important stuff. The commissary, you worry about that later. So they, they call your name. They say, Brewster, you going on the chain. I, I was in a state of disbelief. I was like, damn, I'm really going to uh, prison. You know what Because what had this year been like in, in the county? Like, did you know people in the county so it wasn't as, like... Yeah, actually, I didn't even know nobody in the county. It was when I got to prison where all my partners was at. While I was actually in the county, you know, I'm just in there kind of, you know, doing push-ups, chilling, going through the court process. And I heard that I'm going to prison, but, man, when they come tell you to uh, pack it up, you're on the chain, it's serious. And the first thing that was so shocking to me is when we get to the prison, when we get off the bus, they stripped everybody ass naked. So I was kind of, uh, you know, <laughs> I was just a kid. When you was modest. Yeah, you so was I'm like, kind of like, damn, what's, what, what, what's up? And then, I, you know, strip, get out of them, bend over, squat. I'm like, you know, my heart beat. I'm like, this is serious, you know. So they want you to really turn around, squat, and call, bend up. Like, this is serious. So and they're not saying it nice, are they? Oh, no. Nah, they, they for real. And then when you go through the intake, now we're going in the showers. And I'm just like, you know, in the county, you get to shower by yourself. It's a shower on okay. the wing. Okay, this prison, everybody, it's, it's 100 men in her ass naked showering right here next to you. Like, you know, it was just blowing my mind. I'm like, damn, I'm in prison, bro. Damn, I'm tripped out. Like, this is what's going through my head. You know, they shaving you and now they done gave me the jumpsuit and I'm just like, damn, man. Man, how you do this to yourself, man? That's, that's all that's going through my brain and then... I know I'm from Dallas. I know I'm from Oak Cliff. So I know that when I get to the uh, to the wings, you know, you finna have to get on. You finna have to stand on that. I often tell people, man, them things you're doing in the streets when you get down there, bro, ain't no guns down there. And them guards, they going to lock the door out the count time, and it's just you and them up in there. Mm. Mm. It's, it, you know, it's not nothing. I think too many people take prison lightly like it ain't nothing. And I'm telling you, uh, man, it is most definitely the real deal. You ain't finna better call your mama, your daddy, ain't it, brother, uncle. When you go up in there, it's all about you. You're 17 years old. Are you smaller than everybody? Yeah, they used to call me Lil' K because I was so little. When people see me now, they be thinking I'm on steroids. <laughs> For real, I just came you back. You said life is good. That's called life being good. Man, <laughs> I just came back from the prisons about a few days ago, and when I go back and they see me, they be like, bro, what is you eating out there? <laughs> what is you doing? You I said be everything. Like, yeah, everything. <laughs> But yeah, I was very, uh, I was real little in prison. I about like 180, 190. But and so everybody around you is so big. So right. on this first day where you're having a strip, you're coughing, you're going into the showers, are you looking like, dog, everybody's so much bigger than me? Like, I gotta really be prepared for this. Like, and I'm yeah. trying to paint this picture for our youngsters that are that are. Oh no, it's serious. When I'm telling you, when they told us to strip, I'm thinking like. They finna take me around here and strip like, nah, right here on this wreck yard in front of everybody out here, you finna get ass naked, you finna bend over, squat, and you finna call. And it's like, that right there mentally just was like, oh my God. Were you scared about being, and, and I don't mean it in a disrespectful way, I mean it in just a, look, at the end of the day, we all have feelings and emotions. Man, I was petrified. Wow. I, uh, I was petrified walking in that prison. I believe that's one of the reasons why my time started out so hard. I went through the door wanting to fight. I was I wanted to make sure that uh, I was gonna be all right. You know, I'm scared. I done heard all these stories. So as soon as I got there and seen one of my homeboys, hey, y'all got some knives? What's what, what's up? Where everybody? Hold up, look, bro, chill. I'm just trying to make sure, bro, because you know I ain't finna let nobody. You know, but this is your mindset because you done heard so much about prison and you don't watch the movie so you know when you get in there and then the first thing is strip get out of them and it's like oh we man you sweating and, and you little you 17 you, know, you young this my first and i often tell people the first time i ever left my neighborhood was to go to prison not a vacation was to go to prison i had never even been to houston 
right down the street. Adrian. I had never been nowhere. That is yes. a strong statement. Yeah, no, nah, I'm serious. This is why I love truck driving, man, because, you know, it give us a chance to get outside of our neighborhoods. At 17 years old, I had never left Oak Cliff. And the first time I left was to get on that Bluebird and go to prison. Where they telling me the first day, get out of them, get naked, bend over, cough. Hey, here's your jumper. This is your mat. This your bunk. This is your job. And that's that. So you say you were sentenced to 10 years. I was sentenced to 10 years. Now, the math ain't mathing because you was in there 13. So, right. uh, <laughs> where, yeah. where, where did the extra three come from, Adrian? So, uh, <laughs> I picked up a case while I was in prison. Okay. Uh, once once I got down there, you know, I got past the fighting and all that. Um, you're going to learn that uh, people down there are getting money. It's ways to get money. This is where you're going to learn your, your survival tactics. So in the process of doing that, I got caught up hustling down there. Mm -hmm. So it was either tell on the young lady who uh, was bringing me in the weed, or it was either take the case. And man, uh, man, I could never come back home with nothing like that on my name. It, it didn't have nothing to do with me trying to be bad and hard. I just knew that I couldn't never come back to Dallas, Texas, with something like that on my name just because I really am from the streets in real time. Like, mm -hmm. so you know, I took the case and. It was a five-year sentence, but I waited two years, so they give you three. I got two years back time, and I did three years. That's how I did 13. Okay. Okay. I know. God, he He give his strongest battles. <laughs> I, I'm telling you, like, and it goes back to what you said earlier. Everything happens for a reason. Right. This may sound so terrible, but knowing what I know of you and just me watching your social media and just being in your presence. See, there's one thing watching somebody on social media. You don't have to be in somebody's presence for very long to no. know, to know yeah. what's in here and that God has given them a purpose. And as bad as it sounds, it had to be you. Man, it's crazy that you say that, man. My wife be telling me that. I be like, man, that's some hell of a shit you be saying. Yeah, baby, it had to be you to go through this. I'd be like, man, he couldn't figure out something. something I know, right? <laughs> Wasn't there another route it we could have taken? It was another route we yeah. could have taken. But me watching you on social media, like you said, you go into the prisons. Right. Um, you ain't, it ain't, you ain't phony. Nah. Um, you talking to the kids at the school, you telling them, like, and you're yeah. talking to them, you're, you're trying to prevent. And then the ones that are there, you're trying to let them know that there is another opportunity when they come out because that's a whole nother thing when you come out of prison. And I was oblivious to this, but when I was in college, my mom actually let somebody that got out of prison come live with us. Okay. And then after that, we had a couple of people that I said, my mom was running halfway house. I was like, what is going on? <laughs> um, and that's when I learned because before that, I didn't understand like Come back and get a job. Like, what's the big deal? Like, right. you, and there are not opportunities for people that get out of prison. It is a first of all, you've been gone for 13 years. So when you right. come out, it's a whole new world. It's a whole new world. Uh, I didn't even really comprehend what I was up against until I walked out. Cause you just thinking I'm gonna be I'm about to be free and things gonna go back to what they were. Right. Uh, I tell people prison prison handicaps us from the standpoint in prison you guarantee three free meals. You guarantee clean clothes. You guarantee somewhere to lay your head, shower. Okay, well, the day they release you from prison, you just became responsible for all those things. Mm. So, you know. And then what uh, they giving you? How much money? $50? $50. I, nah, I got $50. It's $100 something. Yeah, so they give me $50 when I, um, when I got there. Now, they gave me my whole $100 because I didn't go on parole. So they give you like $50 and then you got to get the other 50 but I got that hundred dollars. I don't even know what I did with it. But you come out of prison after thirteen years, right. and they literally say, "Make this hundred dollars last. Make it work. Make it last. And if you're not able to, that's why seventy six percent of all inmates return back to prison within their first three years. Because when they walk out, they don't have a skill set. They don't have a plan. They don't have an agenda in their mind and in their heart. Yeah, I want to go do right. But you want to go do right don't mean you're going to do right because when you get here, it's obstacles. It's, uh, you know, I might have to stand in line to get this job. I got to go through the DMV to get my ID. They may set you out. I need two forms of identification. Next, 
You go back the next day, you know, it's a lot. When I, and when I say a lot, it's just a lot of baby steps that has to be taken upon being released that a lot of people not prepared for. Not to mention, a lot of people ain't treating you like a human being because they see that F on your record. They they want to, you know, you know how uh, that go. Yeah, uh, having that feeling, I, I, I ain't going to lie, it's going to affect you. It, it, it is going to play a role in... Um, in the direction in which you're going to be able to go when you get here. But with, with that being said, I tell people it's understood I got the felony. So I need to be trying to figure out how to make it work for me. Trucking is an industry that provides that opportunity. Um, warehouses, they give you that opportunity. I be having partners come home, and they tell me, uh, man, this job paying $14, $15 an hour, and the, I ain't working there, bro. I be like, damn, bro, you was just in the whole squad working for free. Hmm. What you mean? You know what I'm saying? And I be like, you got unrealistic expectations upon reintegrating back into society. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So for me, uh, trucking was everything. They ain't care about my feeling. They don't care I got tattoos. I used to have diamonds in my mouth, top and bottom. They don't care about none of that. So we got to talk about it because that is what. We know you as like yes. big reform. Yes, you out here slanging these trucks. You hey, know, hey, you see what my shirt say? What it say? Let's see. Moving trucks is better than moving bricks. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. So we got to talk about you get into the trucking industry, and again, this is why you are so amazing. You could have done it for yourself, right? And been like, y'all figured out the same way I figured it out. But I've been watching yeah. how you... A lot of people do that. Let's be clear. Yeah, no, 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 no. They go, uh, you know, uh, they ain't just giving the game away like that. When I got in the game, I knew dudes who were telling me, man, when you get that truck and trailer, I'm going to help you. And as soon as I got the truck and trailer, they was disappeared. They was nowhere in sight. So, uh, so how did you... First of all, how did you even learn about the trucking industry to even get to this point of building this, I'm going to say, empire? Right. Um, and I seen one of my partners. Mm -hmm. I had been working at this warehouse for about right right at a year and a half. And my partner, when I see him, man, he got big chains on, big drip, candy red, Camaro on forges. I'm like, damn, homie, what, what's up? You can pay the same me. amount as me. Man, I'm like, <laughs> what, what, what is you doing with yourself? You know what I'm saying? Because for him to be looking as good, I really thought he was hustling. Mm -hmm, for sure. Because he was just looking too good. Yeah. <laughs> so when I'm asking him, he started shaking me. I'm like, come on, bro, I ain't the police. Tell me what's up. And he told me he drove trucks. Wow. I was like, for real? He was like, yeah, bro, I don't do nothing but drive trucks. I'm like, damn, that's it? He like, yeah, I go back and forth, Oklahoma, Louisiana. So when I seen that, I went to the house, told my girl, hey, babe, we need to get the CDL. Like, <laughs> she was just kind of like, where that come from? I have been told you about that. I'm like, yeah, but when you was telling me about it, in my mind, I'm thinking I'm some big fat. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, baby, that ain't really my thing, you know what I'm saying? But that's how I got turned on to it, seeing the lifestyle that one of my partners was living. Trucking provided him the lifestyle of a dope boy, but he wasn't really doing no dope boy type activity. He ain't do nothing but drive trucks. I'm like, oh, so I can still have the sauce and the drip? Okay, let me go do that. And I shot my shot. Failed the first two times, but I got the CDL and... Went and worked at a company for about a year. And this is the crazy part. My coworker, they don't even know I've been to prison. Mm. I, I had to twist and turn them. Because if I, I know if they would have known that I was fresh out, they wouldn't have gave me that type of opportunity. Mm. By the time they found out that I had been to prison, they was in a state of disbelief. Right. They were like, Brewster, you haven't been to prison. I was like, <laughs> yeah, look, bro, I just got out of prison. And the crazy part is how they found out. We was in Atlanta, mm -hmm. and I had to bag the truck up by the CNN building. Well, I don't know how to bag, but they don't know that. They don't. They they've never paid attention that every time we get somewhere and it's time to bag up. Ah, wait, man, let me see you bag this truck up. I got a hundred dollars, <laughs> bro. You can't bag hey, this truck up. That's man. that's that hustle your mama taught that, you. That's the hustle. <laughs> it, they they're never paying attention that Bruce I ain't never got in the truck himself and bagged it in. So now that we in Atlanta and we at this CNN building, I'm like. This series right here. I don't stop. <laughs> Traffic does stop both ways. I'm, my, my coworker, he back here asleep. I'm like, damn, I'm finna have to wake him up, bro. Because this see, uh, traffic stop. You sweating now. Yeah, I'm like, man, I see the lights coming, the police coming. <laughs> so I, look out, man, look out, look out. 
He, what's up, man? What's up? I said, man, I need you to, you know what I'm saying, fix the truck and the trailer. I bagged it in wrong. So he get up, get out, he look around, he bag it in. And he was like, damn, bro, you couldn't do that? I was like, nah, man. You know, and I'm so overwhelmed because I don't stop traffic in the middle of downtown. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? This big old truck. And here you're and the trucks we hate at that point. We yeah. like, man, this truck move bah, out the way. Bah. I'm <laughs> nervous. I'm like, damn, you know. Once he fixed everything, I'm talking to him and I just told him straight up, look, bro, I just got out of prison. So he was like, huh? <laughs> I was like, yeah. He was like, man, nah, quit playing. I'm like, nah. I was like, that's why if you ever notice every city we go to, once we get there and we get unloaded and we go to our hotel room, when y'all give Bruce to his key, I always tell him, all right, y'all have a nice day. All y'all go in there and go to sleep. And it dawned on him like, damn, you sure do. The reason I'm doing that is because I ain't never seen nothing. So every city we get to, I'm gone the moment we uh, get off work. Oh, my gosh. Wow. Yeah. That's really amazing. Real, real, that's real talk right and there. It, and now thinking back. You went to prison at 17, which would have really been when you were just starting to drive. Right. You missed all this time. Right. You, so you missed a Okay. It's all okay. Yeah. <laughs> no wonder you couldn't back the truck up. God damn, no, roast Now it's making sense to my yes. car. He's like, oh, this why you couldn't do this and this. I just had, because everybody thinks driving trucks is hard. Well, I can take you to my yard right now and put you in a truck, and I'm guaranteeing you can drive it. The problem going to be when it's time to bag that, that trailer mm -hmm. into one of these docks, or you got to parallel park the truck, or you got to do something you like that. Because turn this way, the trailer going Go, this way. There you yeah. go. <laughs> yeah. That's when you're going to have your problems. Everybody think driving trucks is hard. No, that's the driving forward is the easiest part of trucking. Mm hmm you know, you're going to get tested when it's time. I need you to bag the trailer in around this corner and hit that dock over there. And it's like, okay, okay. Damn, I how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to do that. Yeah. So you get your trucks. What was the aha moment for you where you were like, I now I'm going to start helping people that are coming out of prison? Because I want people to understand this is the whole movement. This is the movement of uh, Brewster has, it is your life's mission Right. This is what I see it as. You have made it your life's mission to make sure that when people get out of prison, that they have an opportunity. Because I see you all the time, back to what you just said earlier, you have everything the dope boys got. Right. But you just ain't, you ain't got to be doing the street stuff to get right. it, you know? So what was that aha moment for you where you said, I got to, I got to give back? Oh, that's a good question right there. Uh, I think my aha moment came for me when once I had my first truck and trailer and I was going through the trials and tribulations, I actually got real partners in prison. So they actually getting out and I got partners in the streets that's really looking to change their life. So they would call like, hey, how to do this and how to do that? And I'm like, damn, I know how to do that. Do this, bro, and do it like this. And I just started seeing that the information and my experiences could really help the streets. We don't have no neighborhood heroes. Mm. Uh, one of my guys that work with me, I always tell me, like, man, bro, we ain't got neighborhood heroes no more. And when I went to thinking, I'm like, damn, that's real. We so busy looking up and idolizing others. Or when, when I say others, I'm saying the rappers or the big-time drug dealers and things like that. We're not paying attention to the neighborhood heroes. Um, I just heard a song by, I think it's Young Jeezy at ESTG, mm -hmm. where, the, where Jeezy was saying... Don't compare me to trappers. Compare me to great. Pablo died on the rooftop. That ain't my fate. Mm. Chapo, he got life. He ain't never getting out. I did it in some Air Force Ones. What we talking about? Mm. And I was like, see, that's game right there. You idolize Pablo and you idolize all these big time cartel drug dealers, but they dead and locked up. Mm. I'm actually right here in, in the flesh, putting this down in the culture in real time. And you will see a lack of support on this end, but... Pablo and Escobar and all them, the streets love them to death. Mm -hmm. So I look at it like we celebrating failure. Mm, that's so good. And it's a setup. Yeah, it's a setup. I mean, uh, I don't know one big time drug dealer or hustler that ain't dead or locked up right now in real time. Mm. Wow, that's a strong statement. I don't know not one, but I know a lot of successful entrepreneurs. I know a lot of successful businessmen. I know a lot of successful CEOs that work at other companies. And I know people such as yourself who doing their own thing. Man, everybody don't want to drive a truck. Hey, man, it could be media. It could be cutting her. I got a homeboy. He has a mobile barbershop. 
And he has turned this into a whole empire. Mm. I went to the Black Men Summit. Was that uh, Saturday? Mm -hmm. I went to the Black Men Summit. It was a beautiful, beautiful summit. Uh, I talked conference. to Neandre. He told me you were there. Yes, it was beautiful. But what what the sad part I didn't like is the lack of support that it received. Had this been a concert or had this been some some BS or something, man, this place would have been packed top to bottom. And I'm like, man, and they was actually providing real good game and insight on, on marketing, how to get you a home, how to get your credit right, LLCs, businesses, health, you know, the uh, mental trauma that individuals is dealing with. Like, it was so much good information that was there, yet when you look in the audience, you don't even see. And I'm like, but if I if we was killing each other, if we was doing anything negative, they'd be glorifying this. This would be breaking news, Channel 5, but... I don't know, man. You know, that when I see events like that, that's just telling me, man, you still got a long way to go in the culture. Don't think you done did nothing because you done had a little success. You still got a long way to go. That's how I tra translate it. Yeah, because it's changing the mentality. Right. We don't, we don't, we run to drama or we run to money, but we don't run to information and empowerment. Yeah. And that black man summit, it was powerful. Just to see that many black men together in them suits, and we were looking good. I was like, man. You were suited and booted. Man, I was suited and booted. Ooh, I don't know. Okay. Yes. Uh, Dre put on a, a beautiful, beautiful uh, summit. I just wish it would have received more support from uh, the black men and the media coverages and things like that. Because I see all these sites, man, they be so quick to post the negative, the killing. You know, um, mm -hmm. I often tell people when they interview me, well, you know, I don't have a lot of controversy, so this might not get you no views and no likes. You know what I'm saying? We really trying to touch the culture in real time. Mm -hmm. So I understand it from a business side. So, you know. But that that is what the, what society has turned into. If you don't have a big name artist. Right. If you don't, you know, if you are just literally giving good game. It's so sad that there has to be a reason as opposed to like, I just want to be a better person. I just need to show up right. for this. And I, I want to support this person, even if I don't even know who this person is, right. you know? And, and to me, that's what I love about what you do because you are literally helping people at their lowest point. Yeah. I honestly believe that we give the, the guys that's coming out the streets Man, we them guys in real time. Oh, absolutely! Ain't nobody's. I mean, I'm talking yeah. about smart. Yeah. Uh, cause you gotta have you gotta have that street. There uh, you go. You gotta be savvy in the streets. The guys that's coming out the streets, man, we the best CEOs, we the best leaders, the best kings, cause we done actually been up against the adversity. You know, we. So when you in the streets, you gotta shake the laws, you gotta shake the robbers, mm -hmm. the killers. You gotta be able to flip the money. You gotta be able to hide the money, hold on to it. Like it's a lot that goes with. Being a street guy, and you got to stay alive and free in the process of doing all this, man. If you can do it on that on this stage here, man, I know for a fact you can be successful on this side of the spectrum. Just rechannel it. You just got to rechannel it. That's the reason why I go out of my way to keep the sauce and the drip on me, so you can see, baby, we can still live like this and look good. Cause I understand that fashion. That's just a part of our culture. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? We like to look good. We like to wear jewelry. You know, the kings and the queens from back in the day in Egypt, that's what they were. You yeah. know what I'm saying? So that's just what we own. That don't necessarily mean we criminals or that we bad, negative people. You know, you see a black man with a whole bunch of jewelry, you automatically equate that to being a drug dealer. Mm -hmm. And that's that's not the truth. You need to go catch Boss Man Brewster, man. We business owners. You know what I'm saying? I love that. So I want to, man, there, uh, golly, I just have a thousand things I want to ask you. We just don't have enough time. Okay. Before we touch on your books, because we, look, the fact this man wrote books and everything. What has been the most frustrating part when you have people that are you know, getting out of prison and they're in that transition phase and you're trying to put them on? Because, again, it's a mentality shift. Right. They haven't all been success stories. Oh, no. No. -uh. Uh, the biggest thing is that uh, for me. You don't need a hand out as much as you need a hand up. We. Oui. A lot of people be when they come home and they see my success and they see I'm trying to get like Bruce to where if you're trying to get like me, you got to be willing to do what I done did. Put the work in. You're going to have to put the work in. This ain't no overnight success. You're looking at somebody that's working on nine years of being free, of pushing big reform and building relationships and connections. So you can't think you finna accomplish in a year 
what done took me nine years to accomplish. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, a lot of guys that's coming home from prison and even the guys that's in the streets, they think that it's just going to be smooth sailing. And I'm like, man, that's un- unrealistic. It's going to be some adversity. The moment that you declare that you want to reform, now the devil got to do his part. Mm. You done declared your, your actions out loud. So now the devil going to be attacking you from every angle, every which way. You had a flat tire this morning. Uh, they fired you from the temp service. So now you, excuse me, you got to go somewhere else. Uh, you and your girl just got into it. The kids, they uh, at the house acting up like it's going to be a lot that's going on. That's just the nature of it. So, you know, a lot of them be expecting for it to just be a overnight success. And I'm like, That's because nah. you make it look so good, Brewster. That's Man, why people... T- <laughs> I, you know what, though? I I think people believe, because my wife tell me that, baby, you make it look so good and easy. Mm-hmm. And I be like, man, I think because people don't see me com- crying and complaining. Um, people don't even begin to understand the the logistics of... What goes into running a successful business and everything that I put up with from breakdowns, drivers calling in, uh, mechanics, they calling in, dispatchers mad because the driver done this. Like, I deal with so much in a day's time. I just don't cry and complain about it because my mind is made up. I understand, hey, this is what come with that. If you ain't talking about really winning, then you need to go and get out the way because it don't matter what level of the game you in, this is what come with it. Did you hear what you just said? Did I? My mind is made up. Mind is made up. My mind all the way locked and loaded, so I don't even care what's going on, why it's going on. Me and my team, we finna sit down and figure out what needs to be done to move forward. Mm. Solve the problem, let's move forward. Anybody that works for me will tell you uh, my number one thing is, hey, how do we solve the problem? I don't want to hear all the crying and complaining about what happened. I want to hear what we need to do to correct the problem. We had a blowout on the freeway. I right, did y'all already call? The nearest tire shop, do we got a mechanic on the way? Do we got a tow truck on the way? I don't necessarily want to hear the problems. I want to hear the solutions. Hmm. Woo, okay. This is good. This is good. <laughs> this is good. This is good. There, there, again, so much that I, I, so much I can ask, but we can't make this a four-hour episode. Okay? Right, but we do got time. <laughs> we do I got time. I told him, I said, man, Lady J, she a legend of the city. I so it's an that. honor to be able to sit down with you. And I feel like, man, what better place to chop real game than right here with you at the dash? I appreciate you more than you know. I appreciate you showing up today. Right. I appreciate your time. But honestly, more importantly, I appreciate your heart for people yeah. and wanting to see other people win. You, you know, one thing that you mentioned is like, you know, how we say you make it look so good, you make it look so easy. Because people have to also consider when you're on social media, you're posting your highlight reel. Right. Like, who has time to be recording all this negativity and all this drama? Like, you're posting your highlight reel, but you're a real human being that has your own real issues, your own real problems. You've overcome so much, but like you say, the devil's always busy. Um, I want to I want to touch on your books. Yeah, I, I don't know when you found time to write. <laughs> like I'm like, yeah, but you found time to write books. So tell us about. Uh, and I, look, I'm gonna tell you what I love. I love the different. The, the elevation. Yes. Like, the, okay. So book one is when I was coming home from prison. Book two, when I bounced all the way up. And clearly, I said, okay, 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 Rosa put on the suit. Okay, I love it. So um, tell us about the books. Uh, so this book one is so special because I had my partners telling me that it wasn't going to be good enough, mm. telling me that I needed to add more to it. So when I came home from prison and I seen the internet, I was blown away by how at the touch of a button, I got access to millions of people. Oh, because when you went in... It wasn't no... in it, All that wasn't going on. Oh, my God. <laughs> See, those are the things we don't take into consideration. Yeah, when I left the world, I think it was... Uh, I think my space was just coming out. Oh, my gosh. When I when I left... Because I left in 2000. Mm-hmm. So my space was just uh, coming out. And... Um, when I found that I had access to all these people, I was like, man, I got to find something to just have online. Like, man, you telling me out of 7.5 billion people, I can't get it. One, if I could just get a million people to give me $1. That's what I'm saying. If I could just get a million, I'm telling that's you. how the book came. It was just about my um, the things I went through coming home, trying to get a job, 
uh, I tell people living with your silly and living with your woman, them two totally different things. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So that adjustment and just dealing with everything. And when I published the book, I never knew that the book was going to even do what, is, what it done did. I remember I was sitting in my partner car. He like, what you doing? I'm like writing the book. And every day he'd be like, hey, man, you need to finish that book, bro. You need to finish that book, bro. Okay. You know, just playing around. Man, that book right now, in order to get out the TDCJ, out of the Texas Department of Criminal Justice, you're going to have to go through that book. Mm. It's a part of the penal institution. Now, at the time when I was writing the book, I didn't know that was going to happen. You know what I'm saying? This is why I tell people, man, don't ever let nobody discourage you or sidetrack you from what you putting down. Because had I listened to my partners, that book wouldn't even be here. Because mm. they thinking that the book's supposed to be four, 500 pages. They like, man, bro, this, bro, the book need a little bit more. This book right here has opened up doors for me that I would have never gotten in without this. Mm, it's I a part that. of the prison system right now. Hey, this is my kind of book. I ain't gonna lie. I'm glad it ain't thicker because look, yeah. I, 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 this is attainable for me. Okay, yeah, no, <laughs> and that's the mindset that I wrote the book of for for my target audience and the people I'm trying to capture. Their attention span ain't long enough to read the Four Day Laws of Power, mm -hmm. to read the Art of Seduction, to read all these big thick packs. You know, in prison, yeah, I done read every book in prison. Politics, history, science, religion, economics. But I'm in prison. I got time to sit here. I knew that this was going to be like a CD. You're going to be able to go mm -hmm. get you a shot of coffee, sit down, and you're going to be able to run through this and get some real value from it. Mm -hmm. So that's why I wrote it like that. Mm -hmm. Book two, book two came because of the success. You know, I had went from the wreck yard to the streets. Now, I understand the reason why so many people is committing crimes and doing wrong is because of the bag. Mm -hmm. Everybody want the bag, the bag, the bag. If it's about the bag, then from the streets to the suites going to take us there. Mm -hmm. And the suites does not equate to money. When people hear me say going from the streets to the suites, they think I'm talking about making millions of dollars. I have made millions of dollars. But that's not what I'm talking about. Hold on, hold on, hold up. You can't just sit back there and say that lightly. You got to say that with your chest. I oh, yeah. Have. Oh, I have made millions of dollars. I say that proudly because yes. it was a point in time where, you know, I wouldn't have never been able to do that. But through trucking, I can honestly sit here and tell you um, Brewster Logistics has produced millions of dollars. It has produced the income to where it's a million. Amen. I was blown away when I first saw it. I Amen. was like, damn, we doing it like that? Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. How'd you celebrate? Uh, man, I tell people I, my, my biggest celebration was my mouth. Because, you know, just because I made a million dollars, that don't mean I got the whole million. Making it and having it are two different things. Mm -hmm. But the fact that you're able to make it tells you that you can not have it. Mm -hmm. So once I did start seeing a little money, start having a little success, I went and invested in me. One of my biggest investments, I hollered that boy, Dr. Rose. He got them pearly whites. Okay. Yeah, one time for that boy, Rose. Okay. Because he most definitely, uh, he worth it. Yeah. That's one of the best investments I done made into myself. But that's what the suite's about. You know, uh, if you got somewhere to lay your head, you got a vehicle, you able to pay your bills, man, that's the suites. You know what I'm saying? You able to take the fam out to eat. You ain't want it. Ain't nobody trying to kill you. That's the suites. You know what I'm saying? The sweets ain't got nothing to do with money, but everything to do with what's going on mentally, emotionally within you, that peace. Ooh, that peace of mind. That peace is real, you know what I'm saying? Woo, Lord Jesus. Okay, so if there's one thing, how, how can you narrow it down to one thing? If there's one thing that you want people to watch this interview and take away from today. Okay. Um. That's hard though, cause I I it's been like ninety seven nuggets already. But, That's uh, good. Yeah. Um, what do you want people to know? Or I'm I'm just gonna let you take it away. It, it, just whatever it is that you're just like, I want to make sure that I say this while I'm here today. Uh, I need to make sure that the culture know that we kings and we queens. We ain't gotta kill each other to get on. We ain't gotta kill each other, hating and knocking each other. We ain't gotta do that. That's the biggest thing that I want to make sure that I express to the streets. You can be successful without doing nothing wrong. You are already gifted because if you got the heart to pull that thing, that means you got the heart to uh, go start a business. You got the heart to go build something that's sustainable. So if it was somebody watching, the one thing I want them to take is the, um, the significance of big reform. To understand you can really big reform your life and create what you want. You don't have to accept what's been given to you or what's been told you are. You can create it. I'm living proof of that. I come from nothing in real time. 
This, I mean, they see me on Instagram, but away from Instagram, I run a real business in real life. I really got a daughter, a wife, house, cars. You know, I get to live good, and this is real life. And it can really go down, but you got to be for real. Mm, that's good. What about the people? Go ahead. Oh, because I, I was told to interview you. I told one of my two or three of my partners that I was coming to pull up on Lady J. They told me that you need to interview her. <laughs> that's what they told me. They say they, you need to interview her, ask her some questions. We're going to get to that later. Uh, Whenever uh, you ready, you let me know. I you show up for me, I'm going to always show up for you, okay? I got you, I got Because I, <laughs> I know what questions they want to ask. You no, know what just... <laughs> questions they want to ask. I got you. Uh, let, me, let me ask you this. How do you deal with people that kind of were upset seeing you win the way you are? Because, look, everybody ain't cheering for you. Nah, I man, you'd be surprised, man. You know, uh... The people that I grew up with and I did time with, them be the people that's the saltiest towards me. Really? Yeah. Um, man, I got a little partner who just came home from prison. And, you know, he wanted a little homies that's a rider. So if, if it's time to take care of some business, he wanted the ones that'll get down. Well, I snatched him. I helped him get his CDL license. I got him driving trucks. Man, you got homies in the hood that's mad about that. Mm. You know what I'm saying? They, they be mad because we changing. You can't no longer use us to do the dumb stuff. You can't no longer use us to do things that you really ain't got the heart to do. Mm. So for me, uh, in the beginning, it was somewhat difficult because these are people I had real love for. Like, I put my life on the line for you at the drop of a dime. Whereas now it's like, I understand you still there, bro. You know what I'm saying? I done moved past that. I don't want to live like that no more. These people don't let me see that I can be successful without doing that. So, you know. Um, Is that the hardest thing? Because even though we say we have the, we have everything and the gifts inside of us to be able to make this decision, to be able to do whatever it is we want to do in a positive way. Right. Is that the hardest thing? Because when you're stuck in this environment, that is what is expected of people to do. Because you know how it is. As soon as you start wanting to do right and do better, people right. get upset. Is that the hardest thing to overcome is people to say you switched up on them, you know, this and that? Is that um, is that one, not the, but one of the most difficult things is because we're listening to what other people have to say? It's most definitely something a hurdle that it has to be overcame. It's most definitely a hurdle because for a while it was something that I ain't going to say it had me in a depression, but it had me, it had me, it had done touch me. Because, you know, these are guys, man, I give my life for them. You know what I'm saying? These are guys I have already given my life for. You know what I'm saying? So now it's like that I'm out here doing good and I'm living. I got partners that's ashamed and embarrassed about doing right. They still sitting around talking about war stories from the past because they don't know how to create a future for themselves. How do we change that mindset? The big reform movement. This is why I tell people, uh, I don't advocate going to prison. What I advocate is prison changed my life. So if you following me and my platform, you ain't never got to go and experience it. You can check us out. You can live. You can catch that experience through us. So how can they support the big reform movement? How can they learn more about it? Uh, you can sp- support the big reform movement by going to Amazon, purchasing any one of our books, going to reformgrid.com, locking in on our merch. Or either you can book us for speaking engagements. We're willing to come anywhere in the United States of America. And um, we currently trying to figure out how we're going to get the big reform CDL school. I want to have a big reform CDL school throughout America to where individuals coming home from prison or they in the streets. I got a spot for you. And you know, my CDL school, it ain't going to be a regular CDL school. <laughs> you know, we're going to have the flavor and the sauce in there. <laughs> so <laughs> that's the exotic part. But that's uh that's what we looking to do. So they looking to uh help us, support us. Man, tell tell hey man, y'all tell them boys bring us three, four million so we can go buy this land and this property and get us a big reform CDL school. Just as simple as that. It's man, we don't want to talk about it. We want to be about it. I love it. I love it. Okay, tell everybody how they can follow you on Instagram. Y'all have to follow him on Instagram. <laughs> you missing out on life if you ain't following this man on Instagram. Uh, boss man, Brewster. Brewster being my last name, B-R-E-W-S-T-E-R, on all social media. Boss man, Brewster. All right. You on TikTok? What? I say, look, so I can't do the TikTok dance, <laughs> right? But So I always thought TikTok was for kids, right? Man, I went viral on her, wasn't even trying to. Really? So I've been working on the little moves. All right, when you get it, call me because I want to do a TikTok with yeah, you. Yeah, I've been working on the little, uh, <laughs> but I be, you know, in the mirror trying to like. 
You go get it. But that TikTok is nice. Yeah, that TikTok is nice. Uh, the internet period, man. That's social media, man. Uh, that's the quickest way to make a million dollars now. I love that. I love that. Well, I got to bring you back because there's so much more I want to talk about. But We're at the Dash with Lady J. <laughs> you know this legendary right here, man. <gasps> oh, my God. Y'all make sure to follow him at Bossman Brewster on all social media uh, platforms. Uh, don't stop being you. Oh, nah, nah. God done showed too much favor. I'm in too far now. We can't go back. Where we at? Big reform. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the support. Make sure you subscribe to the Dash Podcast YouTube channel. Also, we're available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and more. And feel free to share with some family and friends. Thanks, guys.